For those of you who are in the room, welcome. Uh, you were probably Marie Shep's best friend. So I <laughs> thought I, I don't need to do this long, long introduction, but I'll do the abbreviated version. I, if you know Marie, you know she was born in, well, sort of raised, she was a little girl in the Eastern Washington, state of Washington, but really grew up in the Bay Area, north of the Bay Area, went to school at Sacramento, met an interesting guy there, <laughs> uh, and eventually married him, that would be Dane, uh, and then um, made a huge decision to go to do her MFA at Hunter College on the East Coast, and I think that had a profound effect um, on her art. But like all smart Californians, she came back, and even smarter, she came back to Santa Barbara. <laughs> and um, Marie has been here for four decades, which I think is just amazing. I think she is truly um, one of our treasures of, of the, in the Santa Barbara art scene. So I was delighted to work with her in doing this um, retrospective with this beautiful catalog. I would say if you don't know anything about Marie's work, I would say she's committed to abstraction. Uh, she's a draftswoman. Drawing has always figured into her um, her herb and, um, and, and really everything from silver point to pastel to pencil to pen and ink really committed to that um, media. Um, color's important. Uh, and whoa, does she have a palette? Like she likes her, her bright colors and um, I think that's beautiful. She's also committed to nature. I think she's someone who likes to go and um, really be a keen observer of nature. And that really is often a springboard for um, her subject matter. Um, she's a very spiritual person. A lot of these works um, deal with the ethereal or really maybe even transcendent moments in life. She's an avid reader of Carl Jung and that idea that there are universal gestures that sort of link us all. Um, and again, that also relates to her being a draftswoman. You'll see a lot of the same <clears throat> markings um, repeated um, in different works. Um, what, I, what I love about Brie though is that she, a lot of times a successful artist will hit on an idea and they refine that idea over time. But Marie has always been an innovator. She's willing to say, I'm gonna try something new. So maybe in the last decade, she's become a printmaker and, and it's a whole, I mean, it you can see how it relates to her other work, but it's a whole new direction. And, um, and I love that, that you just said, I'm doing something new and it was really, really successful. So that's my introduction. I will now give you Marie Chef, uh, who's looking at places in between. Well, um, I want to thank all of you for being here. It's um, a big honor for me to have you in my audience. First of all, I just want to say that having a, an exhibit of a survey of 40 years of work is a very <laughs> special thing for an artist. And I am very grateful for this experience. Um, it's, it teaches you much. Um, so I'm interested in, uh, kind of we'll start with the idea of the title of the show, Amplifying the Between. And um, over time, I, I have noticed in my work that there um, have been sort of similar themes. And, and this is stuff that I maybe didn't realize in the beginning of my career, but over time you start to notice these and especially in an exhibit like this and reflecting on it, you start to see things that um, kind of uh, gel and make sense. So um, the between, there is this um, part of one layer to the between is the fact that I had very differing um, art educations on the West Coast and the East Coast. Um, so in California, I just have a few slides of three uh, artists who I, were in Sacramento who I studied with. One is Oliver Lee Jackson, who's a, an art, a California artist living in Oakland. And he does very large, he's an amazing artist still working and he I, I took many, many drawing classes, you could drawing classes with him, and very dynamic. And I think that's really how I became to love drawing. Um, I also worked with uh, Frank Le Pen Le Pena, who is, was an 
Native American, and he just passed away, I think, last year or so. Um, he, you know, I was going to school in California, Northern California, in the 70s. Everybody was reading Carlos Castaneda. Uh, we were boycotting grapes. Um, you know, it was kind of a different time, but the one, one of the things, ideas that was being thrown around was the idea that an artist is similar to a shaman in terms of um, sort of being, using one's ability to see and present back to the world. And there's also, I mean, so I got a lot of that from my exposure to Native American art and to the work and um, kind of culture uh, that Frank LaPena provided us. Um, I also studied with uh, Jim Nutt, um, began drawing with him. He was uh, part of a major person in the Harry Chicago, the Chicago group, the Harry Hu, Chicago Imagist. And he was um, in California and Sacramento teaching for a number of years with his wife, Gladys Nielsen. Um, and I was not familiar with work such as this. I was probably pretty naive in terms of my exposure to art, but um, one of the things that he and other artists within our sort of culture in Sacramento at the time were talked a lot about and showed us work of outsider artists. And this is a work by uh, Martin Ramirez, who was actually from Northern California. And I, I believe, Dane will correct me if I, at the uh, Nut, Jim Nutt, and some of the other artists in that area were some of the first to um, sort of discover him and collect his work. But uh, the thing that I'm taken by in terms of these outsider artists is what this human drive is that we all have, self-taught or taught. And particularly you see it in the um, self-taught, if you want to, you know, kind of use that term to describe artists who just work outside of the market and outside of any educational facility, um, what drives them? And I, I think that I'm really interested in that human sort of primal force about us wanting and needing to make imagery and making a mark about our lives and leaving something concrete behind. Um, so um, decided to move to New York. And so that's kind of the other side of one of my betweens. Um, this was actually our seventh loft in New York, the second loft. Uh, Broadway between Spring and Broom. This photo was probably 1979, 1980. Um, the building over here with the red um, trim is our building. And Dane is standing in front of the front door here. <laughs> 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 So, um, I want to point out a couple of things. First of all, um, besides this catching young men, um, our H. Matthau, Matthau was um, Walter. Thank you, Walter Matthau's brother. Oh. And Walter Mathra, he had this uh, army surplus supply supply house, and I have been told that he actually did a bit about his brother on Saturday Night Live. So that was, you know, this is the kind of thing that you get exposed to in New York. But the other thing to point out is the red door. Um, I don't know if you can see it from here. Yeah. But that's a Basquiat piece of graffiti. And there was another, on the door, you just don't see it, is a Keith Herring. Um, that's the boss, yeah, yes. When we left in 1983, we had heavy discussions about whether we should take the door off. <laughs> but we were good citizens and, and did not. So we lived on the fifth floor, uh, five floor walk up loft, uh, no heat. Right? But we had the roof. So you'll notice, you, you really, you know, what's wrong with this picture? <laughs> We've got two cores of wood 
to put in our wood burning stove. <laughs> At that time, you know, we had a, a view of the World Trade Towers. Mm -hmm. And then here's Dane and our friend Bob Dykus, who I think is on Zoom. Um, you know, we have missing California a little bit. They are. Um, I grew tomatoes up there. But I, I think that the really funny thing is the phone. Yeah. Yes. If you notice the phone with the cord that went all the way up the stairs. Down. You never know when you might get a call from a dealer, right? <laughs> um, went to Hunter College, 68th and Lexington. And so I'll show you um, some slides by a few of the people, the painters who, um, I worked with in my graduate studies. So um, this is a, a, a decent sized painting by Sanford Warmfeld and he's a um, master of color. Um, sometimes the Hunter School has, uh, Hunter College Art Department has been referred to as the color school. So there's a very large tradition of that. And um, mm -hmm. so these are color grid paintings and um, ones that I admire quite a bit. And in particular, this is an amazing, um, what he calls an e-cyclorama. He built this um, huge round circular device and it's like a panorama of color grid that runs the full spectrum. Mm -hmm. So the people that are in it, you have to walk up the stairs and then sort of experience it in person. So you'll notice that it's very different. There's no imagery. There's no mark of the hand like I had in California. Um, Ralph Humphrey, um, I wish I had a better slide. This, this is very textured, impasto, really bright colors. And it's also very thick off the wall. And at that time, uh, there were a good number of painters, Ralph Humphrey, Ron Gorchoff, Elizabeth Murray, who were using breaking away from the rectangular canvas and using shaped canvases and canvases that came off the wall, Frank Stella uh, artworks that, you know, were sort of, uh, sort of becoming almost sculpture. They were more object-like. Um, I really liked Ralph Humphrey. Um, his work was more poetic than, there, it was kind of, um, a lot of them to me were very lyrical, even though he was using um, geometric, abstraction. He somehow started to cross the line of recognizing the imagery, did things that were windows and doors, but um, not all that obvious. Ron Gorchoff, I had seen his work in California actually uh, before I moved to New York and fell in love with it. He worked with these saddle, what he called saddle shaped canvases. So they are curved this way and also concave. So that smaller image up there, you can see sort of a side view. And this is one of the smaller ones. Um, and frequently have these two images. So even though this is, um, would we call it non-objective or would we call it abstract? I think it's really more abstract because it calls to mind, it, it has, I think, more associations than and non-objective artwork would, but um, so there was some ambiguity there. Um, this was a view out of the first building I lived in, in Tribeca. And so some of my first work at Hunter um, in, used these buildings and clouds. And this is a perfect view that one building on the left is uh, the world, one of the World Trade Towers. Mm -hmm. And then right across the street, there was this parking lot and these other buildings. Um, so inside shot of how I was working, I was working fairly large rolls of paper with oil stick. And so very much involved with the physical act of drawing and wanting this, the scale of it to be one in which you had a more of a one-to-one -one relationship with, not like a picture, like you're looking at a picture that is more of a removed, you know, this I was interested in. Um, and there's, they're sort of cartoony and somewhat, I guess, bad painting. Uh, Marsha Tucker uh, spent a lot of time in California of the, uh, you know, sort of new image. 
she uh, was in California and Sacramento a lot, but then obviously had a great influence in New York with her, her ideas and the new museum. And at this point in New York, there was beginning a shift um, from minimalism to the use of imagery. And there was a show at the Whitney called New Image. Yeah, so here I am in front of another big painting. Yeah, big drawing that's on the wall. They ran this on the front page of the art section of the Santa Barbara News Press. <laughs> and I, I was, I think people probably thought that this person right here, this 27 year old, <laughs> was having a show at West <laughs> so, um, That's okay. So this is uh, the first wall as you enter the exhibit upstairs on the right. And this is a wall where we have more like my paintings. So these, these two pieces um, in here and here are the only works in the show that are from my New York days. Um, this is a small painting um, kind of a, an abstraction of a building that was outside my studio window on Broadway. The building is historic. It's called the New Era. Um, and in the catalog, there's an actual picture of it. If you know the building, you might recognize it. But obviously, I'm you know tweaking it. Um, at the time, I was working kind of toying with memories of images, memories of places and not wanting to record precisely what I was seeing. I have never identified as a, as a realist, even though I do draw a lot from reality and do very sort of traditional kinds of drawings. Um, you'll also notice um, some clouds, which keep reoccurring. And I was using that motif a lot in New York. And that primarily was a reference that when you're living in a city and you don't get out, um, you have the sky as your reference to nature. Um, we had one little scrawny tree that sort of looked like the um, Charlie Brown Christmas tree, <laughs> sort of outside our back window. And, you know, maybe the wind would blow a couple of its leaves, but by and large, you were dependent. I was dependent on the sky. Um, and so the clouds became a way to mark the sky because the sky, when you actually look at it, if there's nothing in it, it's infinite. And so here I, are some of the beginnings of this um, division between um, two worlds, right? Sort of the earthly and the more ethereal. Um, and I, I was very conscious of making those um, making those uh, separations and references, and throughout the years, that the vision of being between two worlds um, has become more and more important um, in terms of sort of symbolism in my work. Um, this is a piece, a large piece um, that was done on paper. It's, also oil sticks. And I, the drawings that I showed you earlier in the loft, um, kind of same kind of deal. Um, this is called Eves. And the starting point for me personally was a memory of my childhood blue stucco California house. And I was sort of like thinking about looking up at the sky or putting the sky against that. And Obviously, it's, it's ambiguous. Um, most people say to me that what they see is, is water, possibly, or sky. And that's, I'm, that's where I want it to be. I want it to be in the middle, that sort of purposeful ambiguity. Um, it allows for more participation with the artist, uh, I mean, excuse me, with the viewers. Um, I made a good number, I think I finished these paintings in New York before I moved to California. And then shortly after arriving in California, Tim Schiffer uh, was running the gallery out at Creative Studies at the University of Santa Barbara and gave me this show. And so this was kind of a cycle of four large canvases. 
Each canvas is six feet long and it's made up of two panels. And the concept was a passage of one season to the next. Um, and it, you know, at the bottom line, there are buildings and, and hills. Um, the buildings by and large are done from memory and their memory of, and then a few of them have more direct references to the buildings uh, that we were living in in New York. And some of them were referring back to memories in California. The hills are something that have continued to stay in my work in different forms, but the color of green to yellow is spring to, Cal uh, spring to summer, as <clears throat> most Californians understand, but most East Coast people don't understand that until they've experienced it. So um, those hills often are a personal reference, personal symbol for me for growing up in Northern California, and also where my fathers grew up in Eastern Washington near the Palouse, uh, on a wheat ranch. And there's a lot of similarities to the spectacular rolling hills. Um, we decided to leave New York and we put everything we had in a 27 foot U-Haul truck and drove across the country. So we're leaving up there. You can see the World Trade Towers. I think we must have been in New Jersey. We had mm -hmm. kind of left in the Holland. We got stuck in a traffic jam in the Holland Tunnel trying to leave on Memorial Weekend. Um, and then we finally made it to California, but there we are in the trucks. Um, I was stunned when I got to Santa Barbara, even though we had visited here many times. I had visited here as a younger, you know, teenager. Um, it was just after living in the city for five years, um, you know, it was like, whoa. I was also a little, um, I felt like a fish out of water. I was kind of you know, being in a new place. So I decided to pick up where I left off with the new era painting and just kind of start taking views outside of where I lived. And we lived on the second floor, Casita, Upper Coda Street. And um, so these paintings are, they're not, I, I did a whole series of those and showed them along with the previous paintings I showed you. Um, again, the, there's this, reference to the sky, the vision, that division. Um, I thought these were very kind of traditionally painted realistic paintings, but when I would show them to people, they didn't agree. They thought there was a little bit of kind of something else there. I started um, drawing the mountains uh, in our area. And this is a large charcoal drawing of I don't know if that's the Cooper Peak. Somebody might know which peak that is, but when you ride up Coda Street, this is, and when you're coming to campus, this is one of the peaks you see. And I didn't know where I was going with it, but I just kept drawing it. So um, eventually I, I kind of pushed it out of the realm of what I would call a strong attachment to what I was seeing and into a more imaginary or psychological place. And it was at this time when I was reading a lot of Carl Jung and feeling very uh, um, affirmed by his notion that um, man is innately an image maker and that the proof of that is the fact that we dream every night, whether we remember it or not, you know, but we're in our dreams, we're processing visual imagery and that that's part of the human, <laughs> condition. Um, I mean, at the time, I, I felt a little, um, I think some artists might relate to me, I, I felt a little odd I'm down in a three car garage converted to my studio and, you know, in sort of suburbs of Santa Barbara, and I've got drawings up on my wall, and I'm like, taking charcoal, and I'm making these weird sort of drawings, you start to think that maybe it's not the right thing to do. But um, Jung sort of, I was, what I was doing was trying to pull personal concepts from my interior life and experiences. Um, and so I learned to kind of trust those images that come out. So, but still I was focusing on a, a lot on this notion of us on earth and experiencing the pull of gravity. And then um, the rest of 
our experience, which is above the horizon line. Um, this is a lot, if you've seen the show, you've seen this is a 21 foot pastel and charcoal drawing. Um, I had done, um, so this is a show at Bronstein Key Gallery in, I think it was 1987 uh, in San Francisco. This is the piece that's in the uh, show upstairs as is this one. This gives you a little bit of a context of it. And this is me working on it in what was at that time called the Contemporary Arts Forum. Um, this was the last show that the Contemporary Arts Forum had in their old building. So some of us people, artists who've been around for a while remember that. Um, as you saw, uh, it, it, my black and white charcoals, um, the largest I could make in my studio was 12 feet. And so when I, um, I kind of got came up with the idea that Contemporary Arts Forum had this really big wall. And I said, you know, what if I make a drawing in the gallery while I'll work in the morning every day for, I can't remember how many days I work, a week or two. Um, and then people could come in in the afternoon and uh, watch it progress, um, sort of as a way to outreach to the community who, you know, that sort of dispel the mystery of making art. Um, so this is, I don't know what day this is, but, and I was very nervous about working in, I wasn't working actually in public, except for the staff and the mailman <laughs> who would come in and sort of occasionally go, oh, wow, I really like what you did over here. You know? And before I was nervous that I wouldn't be able to work. And then I became sort of like, oh, I think I'm gonna hire this guy to come to my studio. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, go, go. So it, it was a good experience. Um, this is another artwork, it's in the show called Evening Nose. Um, this is in the collection of the Santa Barbara Museum of Art. Nancy Dahl was a um, curator then and she purchased it. Um, so I'm very thankful for her that she wrote an essay because she's known me and supported my work from way back. Um, this is another piece called uh, Gift, and this is part of the county collection. Um, I don't know if I should tell the story. Tell, 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 tell the story. Tell okay. So um, Phyllis Plaus, who was at one point the director um, at the University Art Gallery in UCSD, um, was on the selection committee for the county, and she had seen my work and chose to buy with another group of people, suggested buying this for the county. So the county buys artwork and they put it up in the county museum, uh, the buildings where people work. And they installed this in the building department. And for those of you who have had to get permits to do building, you have to walk up these two flights of stairs. And so you walk up the first flight and there's this short landing that put you face to face with this drawing. <laughs> and then you continue up another flight. And one day I got a call and I can't remember who it was from and saying, explaining to me that there was sort of a brouhaha about this piece and I couldn't figure it out. And basically what had happened was that people were upset by this work of art and somebody put a piece, covered it with a piece of brown butcher paper. <laughs> and then people started writing comments, both pro and con, things like, why do we have to look at this in our building? Or this is like, you know, this is, I, I don't remember what words they used. And then there, the next comment would be, well, I think it's wonderful that we get to have art like this. And, you know, it was back and forth, back and forth. So I kind of baffled me, but, you know, I think there's these works of art have all, people have always talked to me about sort of this um, sort of sexual energy or whatever. Um, and there is, there are references to the female, but um, it's when we think art doesn't matter, we realize how much power it has, you know, that it really pulls it out. Um, and this, um, this is one of my favorite pieces, um, and it's in a private collection. 
And I, I think that in terms of archetypal imagery, um, I was definitely influenced by Carl Jung. These are some of the smaller ones. Um, after I made the large CAF piece, um, my life changed, moved. Our daughter, when I made the CAF piece, was about 18 months old and uh, moved to a rundown house that we have been working on ever since. So I, I had a studio, but I started working small. So, you know, which is, those things happen. It's another one of the pieces upstairs. I, it's maybe 21 inches long, and I had envisioned perhaps making a 21 foot piece of that. Um, this is uh, some artwork by my daughter, who, our daughter, Perry, who at the time was uh, probably four or five. And I just was blown away when I saw this because it's this archetypal form, right, by a child. And it's the same kind of drive that you know it illustrates how we just create form and you know what does this mean it just is so uh classic to me and, and so beautiful um as a family um dane and i and perry went to wichita for a month for a residency and one of the days we were out in the prairies and they were burning off the the um crops um, I don't think they do that anymore. I don't know. And so Perry and I were in the back just doing watercolors. And she's, she was five, five at the time. Four, she was four at the time. And this is her watercolor of the fires, um, which I just thought was just incredible. Um, I also have always done a lot of figure drawing. And... This is uh, one of a group of drawings that I did through probably when I was teaching figure drawing at um, adult education, you know, and uh, these wonderful models, one, they were sisters and the one model was pregnant. And so this is kind of um, an introduction to or a segue into some of the works that I've done that uh, sort of use female forms and kind of move them around, you know, kind of abstract them. These are very small silver point drawings. And if you're not familiar with that process, you use a, a wire or a piece of silver on traditional gesso that has a texture and a tooth to it. So that when you drag the silver, little silver particles are left behind and then they become tarnished and leave the mark. Um, it, it's just an example of sometimes just needing to change up your materials to find a new way to express maybe forms that you're working with. Um, so that was, a, you know, like a whole period of time. Um, the other thing when I'm talking about the between, I am frequently moving between drawing and painting. Um, and this, um, you know, sort of finding a somewhere in between there. So this is the second wall as you enter the galleries upstairs. And these are paintings that were done much later than the first paintings I showed you. These are, um, I exhibited them in 2005 uh, with Rose Snell Gallery in Santa Barbara. And I made a conscious decision to let go of painting while I was doing all those large drawings. And if you notice, I started out with black and white charcoal on those large drawings. Then I added pastel for the color. And I was very conscious about my process about pushing the pastel into the paper. And so it, it kind of just became part of how the image evolved. I got to a point with those uh, drawings that I couldn't mix the colors very much because the paper gets saturated with pastel and you can't. It's hard to add without adding a lot of uh, texture to it. Um, so I thought, okay, I finally figured out a way to paint, or at least I was gonna try this new way of painting for me um, where I was using a lot of layers of, medium it was more of a traditional 
sort of um, the, the paint surfaces are very smooth and I'm painting on board. So um, that the look um, doesn't scream out about um, paint or a paint brush. And it seemed to be me to me more like the process I had when I was actually making the drawing. So I was using very fine sable brushes. Um, and it, it didn't call out that, oh, I'm I'm like really thick brushed paint here, you know, that your eye catches first. It kind of more about the image. Um, so these are two of the larger pieces. Um, I love sort of early Renaissance European paintings. Um, a lot of them have this really incredible surface and lo a lot of amazing colors. You know, if you look at some of the um, paintings from that time period, you can see them up at the Getty. Um, the folds in the fabric and all the different colors is just really kind of stunning. It's, it's not photographic by any means. It, it takes you to another place. So um, that was one thing I, I kind of liked. Um, so here's a set of paintings that for me um, also contain this idea of the between in a more um, sort of symbolic way. Um, so, Whenever you see a division in, in the canvas or in the picture, there's on the painting on my right, your left, um, we have the darkness with this light uh, form kind of merging into that darkness. That's, you know, sort of pointing out a, a duality. Um, and there is sort of a similar aspect happening here. Um, there is a notion uh, that gets attributed to ancient Celts, the Celtic culture, that is called thin space or thin places. Thin space is actually a typography term, but um, I know that this term um, is popular in a lot of um, circles, and sometimes it's called thin space, sometimes it's called thin places. Um, I like to think of the idea of thin spaces as being that that I'm describing the between. And what a thin space is, um, it's kind of, um, it's described as sort of the division between the sacred and the, I don't like the word profane, but the earthly, let's say, and where they become knit together. And my experience is that sometimes they're, they stay together and other times they open up. And the way that I describe my experience with that, just to give you my definition, um, when my mother passed away, um, for a year to the day, I felt like I was walking in this very different consciousness that was heightened um, in, a, in a way I had never experienced before. And I, you know, I just felt inside that it was this sacred thing. And it wasn't about being sad all the time. It was just about seeing the world differently. It just was remarkable. Um, so for me, I felt like I was in between that. I also think that that is a place where artists work from sort of um, getting back to the Native American idea of um, medicine people or shaman who have both feet. They, they're, each of their feet are in different worlds and they are the person uh, who presents to the community sort of a connection between the two. Um, and I think, you know, artists do that. Um, in that we, we look at things, we see things that other people may not see. And that's just part of being a visual artist. And so our role really is to somehow find a way to give that back to everybody else to experience. Um, again, these are, some of these uh, relate to um, more female 
like forms. Um, you know, this painting down here um, might even become illustrational in terms of uh, it, it presenting a thin space. But um, I think the notion of how a painter describes space is also something, you know, how we take paint on a flat surface and create illusions um, or create a sense of a reality to the viewer um, that can be really powerful. So, um, and then here we have another from that series. And this was probably more inspired by uh, nature. And I did a series of drawings like this. Um, and this made this one image made it into a painting. And you know, I was looking at the poppies in California, the when they are starting to come into bloom, there's a little cap on the top that sort of pops off and the flower opens up. And that's, you know, it's removed from that, but that's my starting point. Um, so in terms of um, at printmaking, um, this brings me to the other part of the title, amplification. Um, these um, pieces here, I'll show you more individual. This kind of shows how they're installed upstairs so that this is the printed side and that's the image of the, are those printed? Yeah, those are printed. Yeah, sorry. Um, here we go. I'm, I can't see. So in this particular piece, this is, I call these trace drawing monotypes. Um, the goal of this is to make a print. And it's a very basic way. You have an ink on it that covers a plate. You put a piece of paper on it. You draw on the back of it. And then you take it off and you've got a print. Um, as I was doing them, I began to really get involved in the drawing on the back as much as I was thinking about what was going to happen on the other side. And the thing that I realized about printmaking is that when you make a line and it, it gets translated by print, some print method, that line changes totally. And so it's unpredictable. And that fascinates me. I just love the notion that you can't control parts of it. Right? So this is the back of this that is in graphite. And then I have another example, which you saw upstairs. So you also could take, after you take your first print, you take that paper off, you put another piece of paper on and you rub it and you take a ghost, what we call a ghost, the second or subsequent image. And so that dark image is what is white here because when you take the impression, there's no ink left, and, but the ink is all around it. Um, so I like the notion that these are related, they become generational, sort of um, that concept of that is um, yeah, something I like. Um, these are also dry points. Um, I'm working on big plexi and I got normally in a dry point, a traditional dry point, you use a metal plate and a metal scribe and you scratch into it. Um, using a metal scribe on a large scale plexi, you, you can't get much variation in line and it skips a lot. And I'm so um, used to working large and drawing large and having that sort of use of your arm to make flowing shapes that I thought, well, I'll try a soldering iron. So I began using a soldering iron to uh, melt the burrs into the plate. So here's a group of drawings that I began in 1999 as Lenten meditations. And so I've been doing those ever since um, most years during Lent, the 40 days of Lent. Um, the idea here is um, as that's a period of inner turning inside and reflecting on your life and kind of meditating, praying, that kind of thing, that instead of giving up chocolate I, for Lent, I would make a drawing every day. Um, and I use 
my first one that year was symbolic in that I rubbed the ashes off of my forehead on Ash Wednesday. And then I continued using charcoal as sort of a homage to that um, concept of um, the dust that we return to when we die. Um, these are some drawings that um, are kind of pivotal. Um, I, I've taught drawing for 35, 40 years, and many of you are probably familiar with a very common technique called line contour drawing. And in that process, um, the idea is to look very carefully at an object and draw it without looking. And so it increases your capacity to look very carefully. And through that, through watching my students and through experiencing that, I realized how intimate it is. Like if you're drawing a flower uh, and you're looking that carefully that you're recording it, the act of recording it sort of gives you an intimate relationship with that object. And so for me, that kind of translated into this, uh, a more free form method of meditation uh, during Lent. This is each one of these groups of four. It's a different colored paper and that was done in one day, sitting out in the, our field or in our backyard and looking at nature, at the grasses or the trees. Sometimes I'm recording them. Here's a close up. Um, this is uh, gouache. Sometimes I'm recording the movement of bugs or birds. Uh, sometimes I'm recording sounds. This is one of my clever get-ups that I take out in the field. It's my egg cartons and, and salsa containers that I get at Smart Vinyl. And I mix. And um, I had a friend ask me to talk about my color. Um, I had several people ask me to talk about my color. The, the mixing of the gouache takes me more time than it does to make the drawings. So I, I, don't, I don't necessarily think that I have a special affinity to color, but I guess I do because I spend a lot of time in it. So these are some uh, drawings from over on the far side um, on some handmade paper that I made. And these became part of that big green wall upstairs. Here's some stacks of the paper that I made. And I you know, started using the circle. Um, here's another set I did one year, just in black and white. Um, this is, I think this is 2021. So this is a different setup. <laughs> that little flying piece of paper over there is I, I started using sort of ink washes and they had to dry. So I just kind of threw it out and it landed on top of the grass. And so it was drying. And this is a completed one. So it's a combination of ink line and uh, wash. Um, so I'll be showing you some prints. Um, this is uh, called Face Up and it was done in 2019. I'll, the prints that I'm showing you are basically from 2014 until now. Um, in the show, it's 2021, no, 2020. Um, so this is a four panel piece. So I kind of worked up to this, um, did seven years of residencies with, um, up in the uh, amazing print studio upstairs. This, so for seven years, we were making works up there and that's a lot of the prints that you are seeing are from that. Um, this is one day when I'm there by myself and get to spread out everywhere and kind of hog everything. Um, there I'm at the press. You can see the large round plate. I, I have plexi plates cut in different shapes. And so over a seven year period, I've been making new plates. They, I have some ovals. Um, and so one of the important aspects to any of the line work that you see in these prints is that I have made, turned them into taken sketches that are either for my sketchbook 
I or I've actually embossed the plates or scribed the plates on you know going outside right on the spot with my 40 feet of extension cord up uh, near the rock near the library here on campus. Um, so it's important to me that the drawings that I've been using are drawings that I've done from life. Um, I've taken drawings from my sketchbooks, very small imagery, things I did uh, as our daughter was um, an infant making drawings. So I would take parts of those and then I'd blow them up on the um, Xerox machine and then sometimes cut them apart and move them together. And so they get um, kind of changed and maybe masked a little bit so you don't recognize the imagery. So that's part of this, I'm kind of going back and forth between how much do I use imagery? How much do I push it into the abstract? So I'm using a soldering iron and I am uh, creating a plate there. There are my tools and you can see a drawing. So I'm, I'll, I'll have an image, I put the plastic on top of it and use it as my guide. Here I use a light plate, uh, a light box and set the plastic plate on it and then have to, you know, you smear black ink all over and then you have to wipe up everything off. Um, and you leave what has been um, sort of, they call it a burr. You leave that because it, it grabs the ink. Um, here's a plate being inked up. And this is a fun time when I really, I get to mix up my ink and kind of use that brayer and roll it out. Some of the plates, instead of inking in the lines, I will ink over the whole plate and you get an image like this. So that wherever you see white, it's the paper coming through. And those little channels are um, where you see, see it as green of the ink. It, there are parts that are high enough that the brayer comes into contact with it and, and leaves ink. So, um, so this, you can see some black lines as well. So that shows that this, this is a detail of, an, of a larger print, got run through the press twice, once for the black line and then another time for the green. Um, just so you see the evolution, this was the first year I started experimenting. Um, and so they were singular circles and multiple layers. Um, I started adding to my collection of plates and sizes and experimenting more with color. Um, this is a group that's upstairs called Seven Days. And this was work from one, um, one summer. What time did we get started? I'm running out. Yeah. <coughs> Are we okay? Or I'm gonna. Um, so these prints, I'm only showing you three close-ups. This is day one. Each of these prints, it, it's a little different from my other process in that I made a very large plate with a set of lines on it that you can see more clearly here. Um, these lines that are coming up from the bottom and some of the faint lines. So what I did was um, I created this one plate that would cover the whole page and I inked it and ran it with a, and, and got really dark lines. And it was so difficult to ink that I just said, I'm gonna keep seeing how many ghosts I can get out of this because I don't wanna have to ink it again. So I <laughs> kept going and I got nine impressions. And this was probably one of the latter ones so that it was light. And I thought, well, this is okay. It doesn't have to be black. I don't have to ink up late ever again. I'm not going to. <laughs> um, wait, from my viewpoint, Dan, is that green? Yeah, it's not, it's not the yellow that's up there. This is so weird. I apologize, this is weird because that, that's like bright yellow and it's bright yellow on my screen. Mm. Anyway. Um, yeah, so, um, so anyway, I, I created these um, seven. I decided on breaking it up in terms of the days of the week. And, you know, I'm, I'm interested in 
creation stories, um, including um, the New Old Testament Genesis, and you know, read that. Um, I'm not. I try not to be illustrational. I don't, and I, I think of those stories more metaphorically. And so, I was hoping that somehow my work could carry um, some meaning in that. And you know, I'm not really sure it did, but it's okay. It's just a way to experiment with um, meaning and that. Um, this, these lines I'll point out, there's, uh, we were fortunate that dark black line up there is actually a gesture drawing that I took from my sketchbook. We had um, been to Marina Abramovic's 2010 um, exhibition in New York at MoMA where she was sitting across from people for hours every day, for many days. And we watched and, and I drew, and she took a particular pose that struck me. I thought it was very emotional. She kind of moved down, bent down. And to me, it was, it was almost a pose of supplication. And so that's, you know, it's a small drawing and I just kept blowing it up and on the, um, Xerox machine so that I could create a plate for it. So um, this is called Between the Ordinary. And uh, it, I made um, in the gallery. I made it in my studio first, then made it in the gallery. <laughs> this is supposed to be green. And that is, those darker shapes are supposed to be lighter. That's their lighter yellow, if you saw the show. Um, those shapes that are painted underneath the actual drawings that are uh, installed on top are um, echoes from the other side, the print on the other side. So we can look at it here. Um, I wanted them to relate to each other. And, and again, this is a kind of a conceptual idea of the between in that this green side um, has these drawings that I've made from real life, from my experiences in the real world. Um, the green is a color that I have kind of always used. And in the beginning, I didn't have any associations for it necessarily. Uh, a lot of times I chose it for areas that might be called sky, but I didn't, because I didn't want to use blue because I didn't want it to look like a sky, so I'd use green. Um, and then, you know, I, I'm using it here as a little bit of a reference to the liturgical year uh, in the Christian church, uh, ordinary time, which is the time between the special days, mm -hmm. right? But I, I think every day is a special day. So, um, so this is kind of a nod to the earthly. And then the other side uh, called face up is those images are removed. I mean, they're more generations. Like I've taken some of these shapes and created paintings, I mean, prints with them, created plates. And so it's a little more ethereal, I'm hoping, to the, the earthly and the corporeal. Um, here we are, here's me taping and masking so that we could paint. And my incredibly helpful husband and art studio advisor. <laughs> yes. Um, pulling off the tape, that's fun. It's a close up of another of my handmade paper drawings on install. This was, I had created in my studio and had I made these tracings so I wouldn't lose my place. I didn't wanna have to make decisions on the spot. So I decided all this, uh, worked all this out um, in the studio ahead of time. <laughs> and there we are, very happy. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and the show was up. And if we want questions, we have questions, yeah.